Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. In the spring of 1954, one man's lust would lead to deception and death. With the help of an obscure but deadly insect, the Spanish fly. Two women who survived the Blitz would be cruelly claimed by one of the most potent poisons in the world. People do wonder how something the size of a grain of sand can dismantle the human body. Arthur Ford's obsession would lead him down a deadly path. He got hold of a date rape drug and gave it to a woman for his own ends. A married man with children, supposedly happy, but he was very dishonest to his own wife and family. I mean, that is disgusting. Forty-four-year-old Arthur Kendrick Ford ran the wholesale office of a pharmaceutical firm. The job had provided a home for his wife and two children in Hounslow, a suburb west of London. The routine of travelling into the capital's Euston Road had only been interrupted by the Second World War, in which he served. Arthur Ford may have had a safe, secure sort of life, a safe job, a nice family, wife and kids back at home, but he wanted a bit of excitement. Ford appeared to find that excitement at the office, where he oversaw a team of 26 clerks. 24 of them were female typists. One of them was 27-year-old Betty Grant. Betty was attractive, unmarried, and the focus of Arthur Ford's lust. A lust that was fast becoming insatiable. Betty Grant was a secretary at the firm where Arthur Ford worked, and he developed a crush on her, a passionate attraction, which wasn't reciprocated. Betty had joined the firm 13 years earlier. During that time, she and Ford had become friends, but not lovers. It was a state of affairs that frustrated Ford to distraction. For weeks, Arthur Ford had been pestering Betty for sex. But Betty had been putting him off, tactfully treading the delicate line between keeping her job and the ego of her boss. An experienced member of the team Betty sat close by to a more recent recruit, 19-year-old June Mallins. June had returned to her childhood home of London. She had moved from Cliftonville, where she taught scripture lessons at St Paul's Church and helped run the family business. June's glowing demeanor caught the attention of a photographer who encouraged her to enter the local beauty competitions. I believe that it was he that spoke to her about entering competitions at then the Lido Pool. 
She was very successful. She won three contests. When you think that she was doing beauty contests, she was working at home to help mum and dad. She was doing Sunday school and uh, she was doing amateur dramatics. She loved dancing. She was, well, she was just terrific, actually, to be honest, a bit emotional. In early 1954, June had returned to London with her fiancé, John. He was a lovely person. I think he was two years older than June. I remember June and John coming in and John had already asked permission of Dad for her hand in marriage, which I didn't know about. And they said they'd got engaged and because that was a very happy event for us. A charming man, my best mate. Um, yeah, he was like a brother, very close. While June and John's relationship flourished, Arthur Ford's actions descended into deceit. According to Ford, he and Betty shared a fondness for each other. But with each passing day, Betty continued to resist the moves made on her by the married middle-aged manager. On the morning of Monday, the 26th of April, Arthur Ford was determined to change her mind and resorted to extreme measures to do so. Arthur Ford decided that an aphrodisiac known as Spanish fly was possibly the thing that would help him to succeed in seducing Betty. He'd served time in the Second World War in the Far East where he'd heard stories about Spanish fly. And he remembered from those days that it was wrongly, in fact, thought to be an aphrodisiac. And that's what got him into trouble. A lot of people in the 50s and 60s thought that Spanish fly was an aphrodisiac. In fact, it was far from it. It contained a very, very dangerous drug. He discovered through the chemists at the company where he worked that the main ingredient of Spanish Fly was something that was actually produced and supplied through the company he worked for. That something was a naturally occurring blistering agent called cantharidin. Cantharidin is produced by blister beetles, one of which is known as the Spanish Fly. secreted and offered by the male beetle after mating. In the natural world, the female beetle uses the odorless and colorless substance to protect her eggs against predators. In medicine, it's used by dermatologists to burn off warts. Its alleged aphrodisiac properties, however, have been a lethal misnomer for centuries. Um, if it's taken by mouth, it's highly poisonous. Instead of fanning the flames of sexual desire, cantharidin burns the tissue it comes into contact with. Very, very poisonous indeed when taken internally. It causes internal bleeding and leads directly to coma and death quite quickly. Though surrounded by pharmaceuticals, Ford was an administrator who had little understanding of their impact. But that didn't deter him. Ford was now fixated on the mythical arousal qualities of cantharidin and was on a mission to acquire it. At 10 o'clock on the morning of April the 26th, Ford sought out Richard Lushington, the company pharmacist. He found him in the supply room and asked Lushington if he stocked the drug. He talked with the pharmacist and just asked him about the substance, and the pharmacist made it clear to him that it was a dangerous poison. He didn't want to dispense this drug to him at all. He had warned him about how dangerous it was. But either he didn't understand that or thought that perhaps in very tiny amounts it wouldn't be, and still went on to use it. Ford left the supply room, but not before he made a careful note of where Lushington stored the drug. Ford was hatching a plan to seduce Betty. 
Arthur snuck into the storeroom and stole a quantity of the drug. What he decided to do was to go to a local shop near the firm and buy some coconut ice, which is a kind of confection. And with a couple of pieces of this, sprinkle some discantharides onto the coconut ice. When the sun rose on April the 26th, it appeared to be another ordinary working day. When Betty Grant and June Mallins left their homes that morning, neither could have foreseen the tragic trap that lay waiting for them. But Arthur Ford was unfurling his conniving scheme. During his lunch break, he headed out to a local sweet shop and returned with a bag of chocolate-covered coconut ice. In his office, Ford became the rogue alchemist. Using the tips of a pair of scissors, he laced some pieces of the confectionery with the deadly cantharidin. For the team members tapping away on their typewriters, it wasn't unusual for Ford to emerge with some afternoon treats. No one objected to the fact that Arthur insisted that certain members of staff chose and ate certain pieces of coconut candy, even though they were identical. Unbeknownst to Betty, she was about to ingest a vicious drug that had no antidote. Brought them into the office, handed them round. You know, he obviously had spiked a certain amount of them. And he handed one, of course, to Betty, who was his target. Apparently, he had one himself. Ford handed a piece to June Mallins, who placed it on her table to save it for later. He actually put about two grains of this poison onto that piece of icing. We do learn that uh, that piece of icing that was um, doctored by this, with this poison had been cut in half. Not all the girls were offered. There was quite a lot of girls in the typing pool. And only about half an hour, half a dozen were offered it. Within an hour of eating the coconut ice, June was experiencing stomach pains. By 3.20 in the afternoon, Betty Grant had joined her in the office sickbay, feeling nauseous. Both Betty and June became very ill. First June became ill, got you know, quite violently sick. Betty took her to the sick bay to care for her, and she was, she was really ill, and she just kept being sick, apparently. She was rushed to the hospital. In the meantime, Betty was feeling ill, apparently. She succumbed to the same thing. She started getting ill herself. A little later, Arthur Ford complained of a headache and was close to fainting. By four o'clock, he had collapsed on the floor. June's condition was deteriorating. Just after five o'clock, pharmacist Richard Lushington was so alarmed, he drove her to University College Hospital nearby. When the doctor examined her there, her mouth and tongue were red and raw. Betty travelled to her home in Chobham Gardens in southwest London in a taxi. But by the time she arrived at six o'clock, she needed help getting from the taxi to the front door. Her mother, Beatrice, immediately put her to bed, but Betty only grew weaker. She started vomiting blood. Her abdomen was in chronic pain, and she was going into shock. Finally, she was rushed to hospital. An emergency pump was administrated, but to no avail. By the next morning, she was dead. Apparently, that once you ingest this drug, there's no turning back. You can't, there isn't a cure. You can't stop it once it's inside your system. So they were, you know, doomed. 
He wanted to get that woman in, under his control, but for the fact she ended up killing someone for something that you've been warned off of doing and, and you've been told that it could kill, went ahead and did it despite the warnings and I, I, I don't know what he was thinking. The results of it were catastrophic. June's brother, Reg, was just 15 years old when his family received some unexpected visitors 80 miles away in Margate. The police actually came. I do remember that because we wondered why are they here. Dad got a taxi. We didn't have a car. We got a taxi. Mum, Dad and I uh, got in the taxi and we went up to London to the hospital. Um, and I just sat in the corridor and I remember mum and dad going somewhere and coming back tremendously emotional. Always remember that. We learnt that she died. It totally burnt the insides of the girls out. They were, no way were they ever going to live and I remember the, being told um, that if she had a survived, never have had children, ever had children, ever. But um, by the scientist's report, um, it clearly stated that uh, the dose was so, so uh, large that uh, neither girl had a chance, never had a chance. The dosage was horrendous, tremendous, what he, he actually did. And though he worked in this um, company, he had no knowledge of, of, of drugs. The family had to break the news to June's fiancé, John. John was still there. He spent a lot of time with mum and dad. Even when I wasn't there, he was there. And um, he was extremely cut up. Basically, a young couple, their life was ruined. Uh, because they were going to get married, I think it was about August in that year. The pathologist fairly quickly realised that cantharidine had been used as a poison. This would have been double-checked with the police. The deaths were now a police matter. The first time they interviewed Ford, he was recovering in the same hospital that June had been admitted to. When the police told him both women had died, Ford was stunned. He'd mentioned in the hospital that he thought the coconut ice might have been contaminated. But Ford's initial statements failed to convince the police. At first, he denied stealing any of the cantharidin, then later admitted he did. He denied lacing the coconut ice, but later owned up to this too. What the police now had to establish was why he had stolen the drug. He made some sort of story up about um, he was going to feed it to some rabbits, so I don't know where to make them more amorous, I don't really know. Realising the police were unconvinced, Arthur Ford revealed his true motive. Lust. She kept putting me off, Ford told investigators. I made up my mind to give her cantharidin to stimulate her desire for me. His intention was to sexually arouse the secretary that he had a crush on and not to, not to kill them. Satisfied that Ford's motive was sex, not murder, police charged him with manslaughter. The following month, Ford's trial was heard at London's Central Criminal Court. He was prosecuted for what happened in, in 1954. He was arrested and he was tried at the Old Bailey. The two women that survived, that were workers at the pharmacy, they testified at the uh, court proceedings. And Arthur Kendrick was found guilty of manslaughter. 
On June the 18th, 1954, the Lord Chief Justice handed down his sentence. It generated shock. Ford received a jail term of five years. I would just listen to my parents and whatever they commented on, I'd probably agree. They were very, very annoyed, upset, angry. Someone given five years, and you know they're not doing five years, they only do 50% of that. I think that's annoying. But I think when you lose someone like that, you really think it's, um, you know, eye for an eye, you know, so they probably thought you should have life. I mean, I know that's ridiculous and that's not the law. To do what he did, and I know June only got it by accident, but his intentions of what that man did, very, very bad, and you no, know, it was a very short sentence, very short sentence. But that's the English law, you know, so, um, no, they weren't happy, angry. June's fiance, John, was also incensed. When he did go down, John had to be restrained because he threatened to kill him. He lost the love of his life when they were young and um, it affected him greatly. Such a small sentence for such a big thing in people's lives. That man got on with his life. He had a couple of, at least a couple of children and lived probably a normal life. I mean, I know that he had jobs in the future, went into engineering, I think. He got to live his life. June and Betty didn't, you know, they, they were cut short. As Arthur Ford began his sentence, he left a wake of tragedy and devastation for Betty and June's families. Dad changed. <laughs> he took it within, with himself. He just was quiet. Mum, well, she was ill. Uh, I, she had to go to Shooters Hill Hospital, South London, and she used to have electrical treatment. Because of the hotel, Dad had to be there. So I, as a 15-year-old, would have to go with Mum in a taxi, and I used to take her to Shooters Hill Hospital, the first time she stayed in overnight and then she went three times if I'm not mistaken and the other times it was a daily and she used to go there and they used to put electrical treatment on her head. <laughs> it shattered her basically. <laughs> Sorry. It just brings back those memories of when I was young and seeing how mum and dad suffered. When Ford was released from prison, the reverberations of his crime hadn't ceased. John had police surveillance on him for quite a long time because John was determined that he would get his revenge. He never did. Instead, decades later, when John's life was drawing to a close, he made a special request to be buried next to June. His dying wish was granted. June and Reg's parents went on to have another child. A year later, uh, a baby was born, uh, which I took Mum to hospital because Dad had the hotel in uh, Margate, and uh, a little boy was born, which was my brother, Robert. June's cousin, Sheila, carried the fright of what happened to June for years. My mum's reaction when I told her that I'd just taken a sweet off a boy and eaten it, my mum went absolutely mad. She convinced me that I, I was going to die <laughs> any second. It was just so frightening. It really did really, really affect me. You know, it felt quite innocent, you know. It was just a sweet from a boy, but 
you know, circumstances of that, you know, obviously triggered that memory in her, in her mind about June. The memories of June and Betty continue to live on for their families, along with the tragic nature of their deaths. Arthur Ford, in the meantime, returned to his family and disappeared into obscurity. He died in March 1983, nearly 30 years after his moment of madness claimed the lives of two young, unsuspecting women. He was 72. And I hope he never forgot what he did through the life. You know, he was 44, I believe. But to do what he did was disgusting. In post-war Sydney, Australia, many homes were dingy and run down, making them an ideal breeding ground for rats. With that came a new pesticide, but with it the means to commit what was seemingly the perfect crime. No one could have picked grandmother Caroline Grills as a serial poisoner. There's something very cold-blooded about poisoning. It's not someone who's gotten into a rage and has lashed out at a person. There's calculation and planning, and there's something that's a little spine-chilling about that. For years, Caroline Grills's caring veneer disguised a trail of death and agony that left Sydney shocked. She just seemed to be an ordinary, suburban, working-class housewife. We also don't expect grandmothers to be serial killers. Grills started life in the uncompromising neighbourhoods of inner-city Sydney. She was a little woman. She was only 122 centimetres high. She was plump. She was always smiling, always happy, always willing to give of her time to other people. So she just wasn't the person you would expect was poisoning and killing. She was born in 1888 in Balmain, which was a working class suburb of Sydney. She married when she was quite young and went on to have five sons and a daughter. Two of her sons died when they were quite young, and that was something that absolutely devastated Caroline Grills. What propelled Caroline Grills to become one of Australia's most notorious killers remains a mystery. But a desire to leave behind the grim inner city may have been one of them. Mrs Grills is living like many people in inner city, in poor conditions, in these terrace houses that haven't been looked after well. They're leaking, they're dirty, they're old. And I think she gets a little bit sick of that kind of environment and really wants something a little bit better. Possibly that's when she first sets her eyes on her stepmother's house, which is out in the suburbs, is lovely and clean and much more modern. Caroline's late father had willed his house to his daughter, but she was only able to claim her inheritance once her stepmother had died. So she devised a malicious plan and thus began to single-handedly tear her close-knit family apart. Her stepmother had an illness that has been considered by the doctors just to be part of getting older. She loses her eyesight, her hair falls out, she has pins and needles in her arms and legs and she has digestive upsets. But the doctors at that time just thought this is part of the ageing process. By 1947, Grills's stepmother died following a slow, painful demise. Caroline and her husband inherited her house. Doctors issued a certificate for a natural death. 
doctors often missed the signs of poisoning because it was things like pins and needles in their hands and legs, pains in their stomach, their hair would fall out, and they also were affected mentally. So, you know, people would get depressed, they'd cry, they'd behave in ways that were unusual for them. And the doctors often put down all of their physical symptoms to a nervous ailment. Grills, however, had taken advantage of a new potent rat poison. There were an estimated one million rats living in the city in the 1950s. There was a new kind of rat poison released. It had a heavy metal called thallium as one of its principal ingredients. and It was often bought as thal rat in a little bottle. The unique thing about thallium is it's colourless, it's odourless, it's tasteless. Thallium mimics other minerals in the human body and interferes with the critical roles they play, including disrupting messages sent through the nerves. The consequences for the body's organs are catastrophic. With thallium sulphate so readily available, and undetectable to humans, it became a very convenient choice for those with murder on their mind. It seems, you know, she almost got to her late 50s and one day decided she wanted to murder the friends and acquaintances and in-laws who surrounded her in her family circle. Grills had stepped up in the world. Gone were the rats that plagued her life but not the poison that enabled her to take the lives of others. She had her sights set on acquiring more property. A close family friend lived in Lura, a small town in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney. Grills knew this house was willed to her and her husband. So if she could inherit one house, perhaps she could get two. Unfortunately, that elderly woman began to get ill. She died, so Caroline now became quite a substantial property owner in Sydney for the 1940s, 1950s. There was a suspicion that she might have wanted to inherit the property, but there didn't seem to be any major rhyme nor reason about why one would resort to poisoning. Although two people within Caroline's circle had died with similar symptoms, their deaths failed to raise any suspicions. Grills, however, had benefited by inheriting two properties. But a new motive for murder was unleashed in Grills, the power to play God. She started poisoning people who really she didn't seem to have any issues with. She wasn't going to inherit anything from them. And they were the ones that she chose to make her next victims. Believing they were inviting a cuddly grandmother into their homes, friends and relatives were in fact welcoming a pathological poisoner into their front rooms. These are the sort of normal people that she would visit as any suburban housewife would do. They'd go around and visit the rallies, visit the friends, have tea and cake. So it was so normal, and yet this was suburban normality as the venue for commission of serious crime. The poisoner is someone who likes power. They feel like they actually have power over this person's life, and indeed they do. She would sometimes predict the deaths of her family members and friendship circle, and they're often the people who were being poisoned by her. She liked to feel that she had this inside knowledge that no one else understood. Grill's assault on her family intensified. John Lundberg, her husband's brother-in-law, was her next known target. His wretched death came in 1948. More grief followed a few months later, when Grills murdered her sister-in-law, Mary Ann Mickelson. She would make their favourite cakes for them. She would make treats for them. When they became ill, and many of her acquaintances did become ill and bedridden, she would be the one who'd volunteer to sit with the sick person. 
So she was known as someone who was very giving of her time and energy to other people. Within a few years, Grills targeted John Lundberg's widow, Evelyn. But Grills' run was about to come to an end. Evelyn's son-in-law, John Downey, began to suspect Grills wasn't the kind, loving aunt he had known. When his mother-in-law, Evelyn, became unwell, a pattern was emerging that didn't go unnoticed by John Downey. Slowly, they would get sicker and sicker, and then if she didn't turn up for a few months, they started to get better, and then she would return again, and they would get sicker and sicker. When Downey read a story in a newspaper about poisonings that were occurring in Sydney, he started to put the pieces of the puzzle together. So John Downey was reading a press report about Yvonne Fletcher, and that report had all of the symptoms that her two husbands had suffered from before they died of thallium poisoning, and he recognised those symptoms. And he sort of began to think, well, maybe, just maybe, someone's poisoning us. And he looked around the family group, and the only person who was the common factor amongst all of the people he knew who had died was Caroline Grills. he decided to go to the police with his concerns. But they required evidence to charge Grills, so they sent Downey on a mission to get proof. One day, he watched Mrs Grills walk from the kitchen out to serve a cup of tea to Evelyn Lundberg. And as she walked through the door, she reached into the pocket of her dress and sprinkled some kind of powder into Mrs Lundberg's tea and put it down in front of her. Alarmed, John Downey made a swift interception. He took the cup into the kitchen and poured the contents into a jar. He then took that sample to the police. When it was tested, it was found to contain thallium. The police now had enough evidence to begin an investigation. Two of Sydney's most highly regarded investigators were put on the case. Detectives Ferguson and Cray. It wasn't long before they paid Mrs Grills a visit to interview her. She invited them in, sat them down and offered them a cup of tea. She opened up her sideboard and in there the police spotted a bottle of Thalrat, which was sitting next to the chocolates. One of them said to her, do you think that's safe to keep poison next to your chocolates, next to food? She said, oh, yes, I'm very careful, and then pulled the chocolates out and offered them to the two detectives, both of whom took and ate them, even though they suspected that she was a poisoner, even though they knew that she had a habit of using sweet foods to deliver poison to her victims, they still couldn't resist the lure of chocolate. There seemed to be no stopping Grills. Even John Downey, who was wary of her, found his aunt's temptations too tantalising to resist. One day she delivered to him a big jar of preserved ginger, so ginger that was in a sugary syrup and was considered quite a delicacy at that time. She'd made it herself, made it with love. He put it on his mantelpiece and it stayed there for a little while and he one day was looking at it, looking at the seal, trying to work out whether he thought it had been opened and tampered with. And he did a big inspection on this jar of ginger and decided it had never been opened. It was probably safe. And so he ate some of the ginger and ended up in hospital with thallium poisoning. Police believed there were more than the seven known victims whom Caroline Grills had poisoned yet they only charged Grills with one attempted murder. There were eyewitnesses who could give evidence and they knew that the kind of sentence that she would receive for that would mean that she would probably be in prison for the rest of her life. By the start of the trial, the 63-year-old grandmother accused of murder was causing a sensation in Sydney's central criminal court. 
Evelyn Lundberg needed to be helped into the court by two police officers. She walked with a cane, she was blind. She couldn't even get into the witness box because her legs were so badly damaged by the thallium poisoning. She had to have a special seat brought for her. She really didn't quite seem to understand why Caroline Grills would try to poison her. And it was agonising and continued to impact on her health for the rest of her life. The impact of the poison on Evelyn Lundberg's ailing body was not lost on the jury. People were able to see the physical effects that Thallium had had on her. And of course, Mrs Lundberg's son-in-law, John Downey, could give evidence that he had seen Mrs Grills reach into the pocket of her dress and sprinkle some kind of powder over Mrs Lundberg's tea before giving that tea to her. John Downey and his wife were also victims of poisoning and they could talk about that and how that happened to them. There seemed to be some sense in the newspaper reporting that she might have been psychologically unbalanced. We don't know because there was no psychological assessment done at the time, but certainly the way the newspapers report the trial try and conjure her up as mentally unstable, psychologically disturbed. Whether Caroline Grills was suffering from the onset of early dementia or not, the fact remains that her quest to kill in such an appalling way was premeditated and scrupulously planned. Crown Prosecutor Mick Rooney alleged Grills was a killer who poisoned for sport, for fun, for the kicks she got out of it, for the hell of it. The jury only took 12 minutes to find Mrs Grills guilty of the attempted murder of Mrs Lundberg and she was sentenced to death. In handing down the death sentence, Justice Brereton said, under the guise of loving kindness, but with apparently motiveless malignity, you administered poison to Mrs Lundberg, condemning her to at least a life of blindness and possibly death. Caroline Grills's sentence was later commuted she would spend the rest of her days at the high-security Long Bay Prison. While she enjoyed something of a reprieve, the consequences of her crimes reverberated painfully for Evelyn Lundberg. She never recovered her sight, and she suffered, suffered dreadfully. Evelyn died three years after Grills's conviction for her attempted murder. Four years later, in August 1960, Caroline Grills was ambulanced from her cell to nearby Prince Henry Hospital. There she died of peritonitis from a ruptured gastric ulcer. She's the kind of threatening idea of the aunt bringing around the tea and cakes. She does succeed in killing people. The Caroline Grills case becomes the quintessential thallium case with this enigma of a person, an enigma of a crime. <laughs>